In face reading, your nose is a symbol of ego and wealth. People with a usually very large nose tend to love themselves or have a high ego or appear to have a high ego. And see it is very deep and well-defined. It means you're very fertile and also just generally a very creative person. Just a reminder that when you read a face, you have to read all features together holistically. If you just read one or two features, your incidence of being inaccurate is going to be higher. Uh, damn it. Uh. TikTok has a face reading problem. In my last video, when I was discussing the Victorian obsession with ugly children, I touched very, very briefly on physiognomy because I needed to at least acknowledge it within the broader context of that story to help give some historical explanation as to one of the reasons why people were obsessed with beauty and appearance. But then I got this comment where the person called it face reading. And initially I didn't think too, too much of it. Like it kind of made me go, huh, that's really weird that they called it face reading instead of like physiognomy, which is what it is. Hmm. I should Google that. Googling all hell broke loose. <laughs> Red alert, red alert, red alert. That the reason the person was calling it face reading is because face reading is trending. No, God, please, no, 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 no! And people are talking about it, learning how to do it, created entire Instagram and TikTok accounts that are going viral for it. We can't do that, guys. We really can't do that. That's really bad. I, I cannot stress this enough. Physiognomy, phrenology, and craniometry are really bad. There's nothing redeeming about them. There's nothing cute about them. They're not fun. They're not adorable. They're not harmless. They are actually tools of harm and marginalization, oppression, genocide, and systemic racism. Now, I also wanna preface this <laughs> for everyone watching who might be like down a face reading rabbit hole and you might be feeling a little defensive right now. I am a woo woo girl, okay? Like I love me some woo woo. I am here as a woo woo girl to tell you that face reading is made up. What are physiognomy and phrenology? I kind of view these studies as tiers and the top tier, the biggest umbrella of it all is physiognomy. And physiognomy is the study of your facial characteristics, your appearance, the shape of your nose, the size of your eyes, your eyebrows, your forehead size, cheekbones, lips, all of it as a way to read someone's personality, to be able to make decisions about their character, morality, things like that. So you're reading the face. That's why people today call it face reading. Underneath of that came phrenology and phrenology is basically basically just an adaptation of physiognomy and very often they're done together. Instead of the face, it's the skull. Doing the same thing, personality judgments, morality, character judgments based on the shape of your skull, the size of your skull, and like the lumps and bumps of your skull. Physiognomy is ancient. It has been around since ancient Greece. The first book on physiognomy was called Physiognomics and it was possibly published by Aristotle or at least someone of Aristotle's era. From basically that point of creation up through the 18th century. It was around, but it wasn't really viewed in a way too dissimilar from like palmistry. So in the late 18th century though, this shifted. Now a little bit of context, keep in mind that in the 18th century is when we have the beginning of the enlightenment and culturally we are shifting away from religious dogma being the main point of all things to do with science and medicine and, and government and things like that to a more scientifically based society. In 1795, or at least that's the edition that I found. This book probably was published earlier but on 18th century collections online, the earliest edition that I can find is from 1794. Johann Caspar Lavater, a Swiss preacher, wrote a book entitled Essays on Physiognomy. And in that book, he argues that physiognomy is actually a science and that it should be considered a science. Not just like, ha <laughs> ha woo stuff, okay? His argument ain't good, guys. Okay, it's not good. It's, it's really, it's laughably bad. This also says a lot about, I think, Johan himself, because I, I don't think he was probably a very nice guy. Um, but basically he goes, okay. Since we are all judgy bitches, and we all love to judge people by their appearance anyways, like that's what we all do, right? That makes physiognomy a science. Like that's how we know it's a science because we all do it already. And if you think that I'm exaggerating with the whole being like, ah, oh, we're all judgy bitches. <laughs> no, I'm not. Here's the quote. It is indisputable that all men, absolutely all men, even you, estimate all things whatever by their physiognomy, their exterior temporary super superficies. Superficies. And he uses plants as a way to justify the scientific validity of physiognomy. Here's the quote. The farmer walking through his grounds regulates his future expectations by the color, size, the growth, the exterior of the plant. That is to say by the physiognomy of the bloom. 
the stalk or the ear of his corn, the stem or shoots of his vine tree. He remarks in their appearance, as a physiognomist in the countenances of shallow men, the want of negative energy, does he not judge by the exterior? It's cold. So Lavater is basically saying because when you go outside and you look at a plant and you can tell when a plant is sick or it's dying or it's not producing well, that that is physiognomy and that that same principle should be applied to people. So he literally compared us to corn. It's time for a sponsor break. And the sponsor of this week's video is actually Birch Mattress. I'm a huge, huge fan of their product. We actually have two birch mattresses in our home. We have, this bed is a birch mattress and then in my bedroom, it is also a birch mattress. My mom, she spends a lot of time up here. She comes and visits me quite a lot. And this is kind of like her room. She has fallen in love with the birch mattress. So when birch reached out to work with me again, they were so kind as to offer to send my mom a mattress for her home, which honestly made me feel like so relieved. And I was just thrilled because I, one, I know how much she loves this mattress. She just kind of had like a cheapy mattress that was like filled with fiberglass and I don't know if you all have been on like fiberglass side of TikTok, what a nightmare. So the fact that we were able to get her a brand new mattress that is made out of organic cotton, organic wool, natural organic latex, fiberglass free, polyurethane foam free, literally I could sleep better at night. That was a good pun. I didn't even like plan that one. That one just like flowed out. Anyways, the other thing about Birch mattress that's great is because they're so focused on creating like the best quality mattress that they can, they use the best quality material and they work with third-party certifications. They are Green Guard certified, they're GOT certified, they're Fair Trade certified, and they're Ford Stewardship Council certified. The bed is so comfortable, guys, that like the dogs will just stay in bed in the morning. Literally Griffy won't even go eat breakfast. He'll just stay on the bed and cuddle with me in the mornings. If you want to give Birch a try, go ahead and use the link in my description below or just go to birchliving.com slash abbycox and you can get 20% off your Birch mattress order. In addition to that, you will also get a 100 night sleep trial, 25 year warranty on your mattress and free shipping in the United States. If you need help setting up the mattress, even though they ship it in a box directly to your door and it is really, really easy to set up, you can also opt in to have a service where they will help you set up your mattress and take away your old mattress. Plus, when you order a birch mattress, you will also get two free Eco Rust pillows. Those pillows are actually made out of recycled water bottles. Thank you again to Birch for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to the video. And the argument was successful, unfortunately, because nowadays we actually refer to Lavater as the father of modern physiognomy. And this guy is quoted all the time in academic articles about physiognomy. That's how I found out about it. A note here about the term science. I will be using science within this context because I think it's really important that we acknowledge where physiognomy phrenology stood within the hierarchy of knowledge and academia. Because nowadays we understand it to be a pseudoscience. It's not used within academia. It's not used within anthropology or biology or anything like that today, but it was in the past. And that scientific validity is extremely important in the role that it plays in society and cultural impact. That is why I'm using science now, usually with big air quotes, because it needs the air quotes. Small nostrils are usually an indubitable sign of unenterprising timidity. My tiny nostrils. Unenterprising timidity? I mean, I do have wretched social anxiety, but I think making my living uh, being self-employed on YouTube kind of also like counter acts that whole like unenterprising timidity. I don't think so. <laughs> and like this kind of concept continues on. So in the 1900 book by Annie Oppenheim, Physiognomy Made Easy, we'll be talking a little bit more about her later. She writes, timid and nervous people move more cautiously and scarcely dare to breathe. Their nostrils get no action, remain close to the face and small in size. The hare and the cat have the smallest nostrils. The bull and mastiff leonine animals have the largest. Just so we're clear here, <laughs> Annie wrote this book after Darwin like established evolution. And she's comparing human features and human genetics and human traits and human evolution to cats. Okay. 
none of this is actually based off of any sort of science. Like, it was literally just made up and it's just been perpetuated over and over and over again by people who consider themselves experts in this. I mean, like, look at this image that Annie Oppenheim put in her book for a criminal jaw. The only thing criminal about that jaw is how severe that underbite is and that person has been royally screwed by the lack of orthodontic medicine during this era. Ew, no, David. So phrenology was invented by Franz Joseph Gall in 1796. So this is obviously after Lavatar's book, right? And that's how he basically just took it and just added it to the brain. So it's the same concept, like I said. Phrenology blew up in the 19th century and it became extremely popular in the United States as well as all over the Western world. <laughs> Part two, scientific racism. You cannot separate physiognomy, phrenology from white supremacy, colonization, racism, and oppression of people and genocide. They are interconnected. While it is called scientific racism, I think another way to kind of wrap your head around it is to call it literally the science of white supremacy. In order to justify white supremacy beyond just we're assholes and we want to, to have the scientific validation behind it, to back it up, they used physiognomy, phrenology to do that. And so having these, these practices practices be considered scientifically valid is an important part of the white supremacy process and what happened in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Let's back up a little bit and let's talk about race for a hot second. So the concept of race and races as we kind of know it today was developed by Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. And in his book, A Manual of the Elements of Natural History, he actually divided up humanity into five main racial groups. And it was those five main racial groups that everything was kind of built on in the 19th century. So I'm not saying that racism didn't exist pre-1825. It absolutely and obviously did. Now now in 1825, science is around it. Hey guys, I just wanted to pop in real fast to add just a little quick footnote. The secondary source that I was using to help with the summarizing the history of phrenology and racism, they cited Blumenbach's 1825 book in the article. And I, when I went and found that, I just kind of took that as like the initial publication. I was just looking for some images to pop in for the video because I'm editing right now. And the Wikipedia page with footnotes says that Blumenbach came up with this theory in the 1790s. So I just kind of wanted to add some clarification that like, yes, the book that I'm referencing, the, the stuff that you're seeing on the screen, like that's all from the period and it's from the dates that I give and it's all cited. It's just, it actually was a little bit earlier than what I thought. However, I do think it's interesting because it's still all taking place within this very like tight timeline of like the late 1790s. You remember that's when Gall and Phrenology and like Lavater's book on young me like all of this stuff was coming out and really gaining in popularity so i just kind of want to like pop in there add a little bit more clarification and uh yeah okay let's get back to well i'm gonna get back to editing you get back to watch. So in the book, Blumenbach divides them up into five races. And the five races are the Caucasian race, the Mongolian race, the Ethiopian race, the Malay race, and the American race. Here's how he describes the Caucasian race. It includes all the Europeans, with the exception of the Laplanders, that is Sami people, the Western Asiatic on this side of the Ob, the Caspian Sea, and the Ganges. Lastly, the North Africans, altogether the inhabitants of the world known by the ancient Grecians and Romans. Isn't it just fascinating? The Mongolian race included all the other parts of Asia except for the Malay region, which I'll explain the Malay region. And it also included Sami people, as well as in North America, the Inuit and Yupik people. It included those two very specific indigenous groups within the Mongolian race. The Ethiopian race is everyone else in Africa except for the Northern Africans that are apparently Caucasian. Okay. And then the American race, that is the indigenous peoples of North and South America, except for the Inuit and Yupik people. Then finally, we have the Malayan race. And this one, quote, to this class belong the South Sea Islanders or inhabitants of the fifth part of the world of the Marianne, Philippine, Molucca, and Sunday Islands, etc., with the true Malays. There were subgroups as well. So for example, like sub races, I think is what he called them. For example, in the Mongolian, like broader race, you would also have like Chinese and Japanese people. I'm sure this will come as a surprise to nobody. Blumenbach just can't have, there's five races and leave it alone. No, 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 no. We have to rank these races according to their hierarchy. And I'm sure this will be a shock. The Caucasian race is ranked as the top, top race. 
quote, the Caucasian must, on every physiological principle, be considered as the primary or intermediate of these five principal races. The two extremes into which it was deviated are on the one hand the Mongolian and the other Ethiopian. The other two races form the transitions between them, the American between the Caucasian and the Mongolian, and then the Malayan between the Caucasian and the Ethiopian. I don't know why it's in a triangle form, that's just what he did, okay? It doesn't matter because it's all stupid anyways and it's all terrible, but that's the shape that he did. So what we see is that racial classifications change a lot as time goes on, but they don't change because of an emergence of new facts they change in order to further suit the oppressor. I, and Indians like me, used to be considered Caucasian. It's interesting how Indians and Egyptians, who literally made the most advanced civilization in the world, were conveniently considered Caucasian to justify putting that group at the top of the ladder, along with the people who looked like the author of this so-called Study. But also, years later, Indian people in Europe were oppressed for not being Caucasian enough, whatever that means, because by these standards, they're literally going against the paper that made it. But what changed? What changed is that Indians are now in the space of the oppressor, and they're taking up space, and the oppressor no longer retains that power. So the oppressor changes the rules to keep themselves on top. It's how modern Swana and Egyptian people are conveniently considered white when it is useful for the oppressor, but are simultaneously considered not white enough and oppressed in really hateful ways. All of this is pseudoscience, because science doesn't change to suit the people studying it. It changes as new facts emerge and are discovered. Racial classifications have always changed for one reason and one reason alone, and that is to suit the oppressor, and it is to be the most convenient for the white man. Like, I'm just gonna take a little moment here, a little time out, and just say, can we just collectively stop calling white people Caucasians now? Like, can we just stop doing that? Because like, not only is it just like factually incorrect, there is literally a caucus region of the world where the people who inhabit that region and are, are from that region and have ancestors in that region are ca actual Caucasians. But also this whole concept of white people being Caucasian is completely made up by a racist German dude in the 1820s. And it has no factual basis whatsoever. As a very white person. This is gross. I don't want to be called Caucasian anymore. I don't want any connection to this person, this history. This is awful. I mean, we don't use the other five, like the other four races anymore to describe people. Why are we still using Caucasian? Like this is like, we just need to put this to bed. Okay. So please, I beg of you. Can we just like have a moment? Let's pass the motion. Okay. White people, we're no longer doing that anymore. Eyes have it. The eyes have it. Great talk. I'm glad we had this talk. Let's keep moving. Within Blumenbach's race theory, this is how people were able to use and then continue to weaponize physiognomy, phrenology, and chronometry, okay? So this is how it all starts to tie in together. Because what these men started to do is they started to, think, okay, well, we have this whole concept here of these races and obviously Caucasian is better. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of this over here, this phrenology and physiognomy, and we're gonna make sure that the best, smartest, beautiful, all of it, like the tippy tippy top is always going to be the Caucasian race. God, ew, David. So like what this did is this created this additional scientific validity to oppress and marginalize and enslave communities. Cause I, I also want to point out here at this point in time, in, specifically in American history and British history, we're seeing a great deal of moral pushback on slavery and the abolitionist movement is picking up steam. In the early 19th century is when Britain finally abolished slavery and the slave trade. And so we're really starting to see a moral pushback on slavery. And so what people who were pro-slavery needed to do is they needed to create another argument in favor of slavery. And so one of the ways that they were doing that is through phrenology and physiognomy and these sciences to back up that black people were not as superior or as well-developed as white people. The science of phrenology is crucial to understanding the separation of our two species. Here's a quote, for example. Um, this is from an 1810 book written by Samuel Stanhope Smith. It's entitled, An Essay on the Causes of the Variety of Complexion and Figure in the Human Species. And in this quote, he's talking about enslaved people in the United States. The domestic servants, on the other hand, who remain near the persons, so the enslavers, are employed within the families of their masters. This class of slaves, therefore, has advanced far before 
the others in acquiring the regular and agreeable features. And the expressive countenance, which can be formed only in the midst of civilized society. The former, field workers, are generally ill-shaped. They preserve in a great degree the African lips, nose, and hair. Their genius is dull, and the expression of their countenance sleepy and stupid. The latter, the domestic workers, frequently exhibit very straight and well-proportioned limbs. Their hair is often extended to three and four inches, sometimes to a greater length. The size and form of the mouth is, in many instances, not unhandsome, and in sometimes even beautiful. The composition of their features is regular, their capacity good, and their look animated. I just wanted to pop in here and add a little bit more clarification because this video needs all the clarification. Samuel Stanhope Smith, in what in that statement that I read, he was actually trying to argue against Blumenbach's and other like um, anthropologists and biologists like classification of race. I think that's also like a really strong indication of how like even when you think in the 19th century like someone is supposed to be like defending, you know, people of color or enslaved people, they're still perpetuating physiognomy. They're still perpetuating this racial difference and using one's appearance to indicate it as such. And so I just kind of wanted to like throw that out there. Just so we're clear, the domestic workers in that situation that he's describing did not acquire those white features through osmosis or just being around white people. Those features were inherited through the genetic father who was white. There is no consent in slavery. Enslaved women cannot consent. Their consent is removed from them because their right to humanity has been stripped. Those enslaved people who exhibited white European features were children born from non-consensual interactions. And I'm not going to say the obvious word because I don't want to risk demonetization because this video is full of keywords. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So what this quote is doing is it is justifying forced birth for enslaved women. Because not only now is the enslaver creating more property, creating more workers through non-consensual relationship, but they're also instilling the idea that the white features are better. And if you know anything about American beauty standards and the problems within with American beauty standards, you will know that white features have always been placed at the top. It didn't stop with slavery. It, it did, it's not like the Civil War happened and then all of this was over. No, it continued on. These stereotypes that were based completely in bullshit scientific theory continued on up through the 1940s and World War II. Nazis also loved physiognomy and phrenology. So they didn't come up with it. They didn't like just introduce it to Germany. I think it's pretty obvious that Germans really loved this stuff. They're the ones who kept coming up with it. So in the Weimar Republic, so before the Nazis, physiognomy was huge, okay? Massively huge in the 1920s. And photography was actually being viewed and being celebrated as a way to make learning physiognomy easier. And so they were fascinated with it at that point in time. And one of the biggest books on the subject by August Sander is called Faces of Our Time. And he actually touted it as basically a textbook for physiognomy, quote, a training manual for the increasingly vital skill of reading face types. So this national interest was already there when the Third Reich took over. And so all that they had to do was take everyone's existing interest and fascination with it and then make it so that way they could use it very easily to, to marginalize Jewish people, Romani people, homosexuals, and political opponents. Because remember, physiognomy and the study of your facial features can tell you everything you need to know about someone. They were able to, again, weaponize physiognomy to kill and murder millions and millions of innocent people. There is nothing within the history of physiognomy or phrenology that can justify its existence today because it has only ever been used as a weapon of oppression and harm. Part three, face reading today. All right, so now we're back in 2023. <sighs> And unfortunately, physiognomy and phrenology are trending on the internet, specifically in TikTok. So if you've seen this filter and you don't know what's going on, I'm going to explain it to you. Here's an example of the three types of cantle tilts. Supposedly, if you have a positive cantle tilt, 
that's the most attractive. I've seen this all over TikTok. I took the time to figure out what it was. So let me explain. Phrenology. It's simply phrenology. Manic depressive or addicted to adrenaline. It's one of the two when you see fishtail lines that come out of the people with smaller noses can tend to be insecure or be viewed as insecure. I'm going to share with you three things to look for in somebody's eyes that can tell you a lot about their personality. In China. Uh, damn it. <laughs> I think this is interesting that it has been shifted into something really cutesy like face reading because when you Google physiognomy, you get a different hit than when you Google face reading. The biggest like first hit that I got was this article by Netta Porter where they interview a expert in face reading on how to read faces and it was this woman named Katie Brendel and then I went to social media and I went to Instagram and I found her and this is her account. She has a highlighted story of face reading which she used ancient Greco-Roman statues for like her examples. And I don't know why, but I found it like deeply ironic and actually kind of funny. This is her website. Her entire business is wrapped up in being an expert in ancient Chinese medicine where she sells, you know, consultations, online courses, published books, workshops, masterclasses, things like that. So she's always selling a product. Then when I went to TikTok and I searched face reading, the biggest account I found was modern hypnotist Lori, and this is her account. She has a quarter of a million followers and tons and tons of videos on face reading where she reads celebrities' faces. She shows off her different books, which we'll get into momentarily, and it's entirely created around face reading. For $159, you can get a 15 minute reading of your face. And I think it's literally just a voice message that she sends you, like a voice memo. I could be wrong, I could be wrong, but I think that's what it is. For $159, yep. Really, sir? In this economy? Now, I wanna make something very clear before I dig into this more further. I don't know these women. I've never interacted with, with these women. I have never been a customer of these women. The only information I have about these women is based off of what they have publicly put on the internet. So on Hypnotist Lori's site, she does have a lot of people who are, bless their hearts, misguided, asking her about wanting to learn how to do face reading. And they obviously don't really know the history of face reading or physiognomy. And so she has several videos where she shows off her books as a way to kind of not only show people what they can purchase, but also to create validation for her expertise. And one of those books is literally a 1907 copy of Annie Oppenheim's How to Read a Face. You know that Edwardian woman who was talking about animal qualities? My thing is, is like, especially with the Annie Oppenheim book, to literally have a book that was published before World War I on how to read faces and have that be one of the things that you, you tout as like one of your like manuals that you reference because of its accuracy and correctness. What? <sighs> and like, before you go, trying to say like, maybe Annie Oppenheim's book wasn't racist. It absolutely was, okay? This is one of the images from the book for someone who is supposed to have lying eyebrows and secretive nostrils. We know, we know that these were tools for racism. We know that the people using these things and participating in, in physiognomy in the 19th and 20th centuries were racist. That was the point of physiognomy, was racism. David, you and mom literally ruined my life. So the other thing that I noticed with both of these creators, they both use keywords like ancient Asian art or ancient Chinese mystery or ancient Chinese medicine of physiognomy or face reading to bolster up and validate what they're doing. Katie Brendel's account is very, very obvious. Within the all the different book videos that Modern Hypnotist Lori has, there's always several books that are titled in that sort of way of like the ancient Chinese art of or the modern Japanese art of physiognomy, stuff like that. So they're both using this as like a marketing tool, but they're also using it as a shield because what these women have done is they have taken something out of its local linguistic and cultural and historical context. They have adapted it, manipulated it, and changed it to fit a Western market to then profit off of it. Hello, Chinese person here. My name is Vivian, AKA Fresh Frippery. I grew up in a family that believed in feng shui and consulted with psychics and fortune tellers. And we still did not consult books that talked about suspicious eyebrows and nostrils. While simultaneously using these keywords like the ancient Chinese art of to act as a protective shield from criticism that is rightly deserved about physiognomy. Because now, if you were to go to them and say to their face, hey, what you're doing is actually racist, 
they can go, well, it's not actually racist. This is the ancient Chinese art of. It's not white people. It's, 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 it's ancient Chinese. Phrases like ancient Chinese art of as a marketing ploy is also bull. It would be the equivalent of me touting the ancient white person practice of bloodletting as a way to improve your humors. If that sounded ridiculous to you, why is it any different from some rando on TikTok trying to sell you the ancient Chinese art of face reading? Just because something was potentially considered legit or pseudoscience in the past does not mean it is legitimate now. So now not only have you taken something, manipulated it, changed it, and adapted it to fit white Western market, but now you're also protecting yourself by a marginalized group of people who were actively harmed and marginalized through physiognomy. Physiognomy was used as a tool to oppress and harm Asian people. We still have people trying to other us using our facial features, such as our eyes. Fox eye trend, I am looking at you. So this is not just harmless fortune telling. It is harmful to try to ascribe personality or moral traits to someone's eyes or nose or eyebrows or other features. Stereotypes are a slippery slope to actual horrible historical things that have happened like the Chinese Exclusion Act and the massacres that happened at Rock Springs and Hell's Canyon in the 1800s or the anti-Asian sentiment that's been happening during the pandemic. And the thing is, is face reading, physiognomy, it's not an ancient Asian art. It is an ancient Western practice dating back to Aristotle. And if you Google physiognomy, literally guys, the fourth sentence of the second paragraph of the physiognomy Wikipedia page says that it's racist and it's problematic. Quote, physiognomy in the 19th century is particularly noted as a basis for scientific racism. And it includes a footnote. Like, Wikipedia knows. I cannot do the mental gymnastics here. I can't. I cannot do the mental gymnastics of how you can create an entire business centered around face reading, which is physiognomy, with books that have the literal word physiognomy on the cover with using the hashtag physiognomy, and yet, and yet, not think it's wrong to not acknowledge the absolute horrific history that physiognomy has, the absolute horrific impact that physiognomy has had and phrenology has had on society today. I don't, I cannot do those mental gymnastics. And furthermore, like Asian countries and Asian cultures and, and communities are actively dealing with colorism in their cultures today, within their societies. They're dealing with the rise of Western beauty standards within their own cultures. So hi, I'm Christine. I wanted to just drop by and tell you all about how much of Korean beauty standards still idealizes white features today. There's a very, very popular surgery that they actually do on literal infants called Sankapul surgery, or it's the double eyelid surgery. I actually have what it is a monolith that, you know, there's no fold in my eyelid, like the skin just goes directly to my eye. A lot of white people have something called the double eyelid where you have a fold right there. It's considered more beautiful in Korea to have that double fold to the point where people will actually have surgery removing the excess skin so that they could have that fold. It's very popular. In fact, my own mother considered getting it for me when I was a baby, but then decided against it. And I actually have cousins who've had that surgery themselves. And it's ultimately idealizing features that are more or white. If you look at a lot of K-pop stars, almost all of them actually have that double eyelid. Moreover, I love Korean beauty products and there are some that I just avoid because it just kind of gives me the ick factor. For instance, a very popular Korean product is called White Cream and it's a skin bleach that actually will make your skin paler and whiter. These are real things that are happening today, even in a culture that is learning how to appreciate their own Koreanness. I appreciate that Korea is trying to celebrate more Korean culture, but there are figments of all of this still left there. So just like in Korean culture, colorism is pretty rampant in Indian culture as well. It is very, very common. And for those of you who have seen the Netflix show, Indian Matchmaking, you might have noticed that they were always commenting on how light the other partner was. It's just so awful. So what preferences they want, I work, I work according. And we know that it comes from 
a history of, you know, colonization. That's not only unique to Indian culture. When I was young, I was and still am the darkest person in my family. And, you know, well-meaning relatives would offer me a lightning cream called Fair and Lovely because they genuinely thought they were helping me. They thought they were making me a better, more beautiful prospect. And the fact that those beauty standards are so prevalent in Asian spaces today, in Korean spaces, in Indian spaces, in Chinese spaces, Faces. It's so, so clear the Western influences of what is considered beautiful and what is considered correct and good in features. Those standards are real and they cause real harm. People have had the love of their lives reject marriages from them because they were too dark for their family. And that's pretty absurd. It's just really, really hard to find any way that face reading is not a problem and is not connected to something horrific and dark and uncomfortable and ugly. Finally, we have this stupid ass video. This one has been blowing up. It's been on Twitter. It's blew up on TikTok. A couple of creators have made videos about it already. I'll link them in the description below. But again, like they just didn't really go too much in like the contextual like history of it. This one just wears my ass out. Guys, this is so obvious. It's so obvious. This is Nazi propaganda. This whole like angel skull, witch skull thing, or the warrior skull and the whim skull, this is all just made up, okay? This is little just like basic phrenology stuff. There's a lot of other dog whistles happening and red flags in this page and in this creators thing. It's just Nazi propaganda that has been TikTokified and modernized to make it more palatable for people who can't see it for what it is. I cannot do the justice explaining this like this creator can, so I'm going to play some a, a bit of his video because he just does a better job than me. Looks maxing is also a term used by incels. That's where they talk about the chat and the incel and how you have to look max to turn into the chat, spend all your money on plastic surgery, work out, bulk up. Like that's what looks maxing is. So this is to like red pill you, but they're using very, you know, genteel images. The image of the angel is very, a very youthful face. The witch is a very, you know, haggard and old looking face. But this is always going to turn from something very abstract to black and white, literally. It's literally Nazi science. And if you are someone who has fallen down this rabbit hole of face reading or this whole witch skull or angel skull thing, listen to me, okay? It's all bullshit. None of it is true. None of it has any factual bearing on anything at all to do with you. It was made up by a bunch of dusty old white men and wanted to place themselves above literally everyone else in the world. And you are not them and you are better than that. And if you think that there's something wrong with your nose, if there's something wrong with your eyes, if there's something wrong with your mouth or your jaw or your head shape, there's nothing wrong. You are perfect as you are. You are beautiful as you are. And you don't need to change a goddamn thing about you. Just be who you are. Your face, your body, your appearance is a sort of scrapbook of your ancestors and you are a representation of so many folks who came before you and your face carries history your face carries stories and beauty in that so don't let some bullshit make you feel bad about yourself because you have no reason to if you are someone who really enjoyed the face reading content that you were finding on tiktok or you thought it was cute and fun and i've kind of ruined everything for you sorry not sorry i hope that this video has helped really provide the historical context within face reading and phrenology that we need to understand in order to prevent history from repeating itself. And if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up. That does help me and you with the YouTube algorithm because it knows it helps YouTube know what videos to show you. And also, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do so. I would really, really appreciate it. And I would love to have you stick around. And with that, my friends, I'll see you all back here next time with another video. Goodbye.